Welcome back to First Draft, and something just smells a little different in the air right now as the man who is the NFL Draft is back with us, the godfather of NFL Draft coverage, the man who created this industry. He is incomparable. He is Mel Kuyper Jr. How the heck are you, Mel? Leon, happy New Year, Merry Christmas, every happy holidays, everybody. I, it's already 2024 for us because we're thinking 2024 yeah. draft. And we were talking before about you know the, the portal and all the extra years that players have in terms of eligibility. So draft eligible means you are eligible, but you could go back. So so many players to evaluate, so many players, unfortunately, this year that we thought would be or we have highly rated that are injured. Yeah. Uh, so many things to talk about. We go to the, the teams picking at the top of the board who they may think about. So a lot to get to today, Field. Uh, let's go and, and go at it and, uh, and try to get as much in as we possibly can. Yeah, and Mel, of course, you're constantly churning out content beyond the stuff that you see on ESPN.com. Mel is appearing every week on the Monday Blitz, talking about the notable prospects. You're doing a radio show on Saturday morning. Mel, love it every Saturday morning. I drive my daughter to gymnastics, <laughs> and she indulges me with a little bit hey, of sports radio. You have an talk. open invitation. Anytime you play calling in field, you're going to be put on. So hey, you, you know what? Around, you got something to offer at any week. You got something I just you disagree with. I said, which yeah. I'm sure happens every week. You yeah. know, feel free to call in. We'd love to bring you on. She's starting to get a little more self-sufficient, so she doesn't need me as much during those uh-huh. gymnastics classes. So this yeah. could be the time for me to make my call in. Yeah, whenever you're freed up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, deal. Uh, and then, of course, on ESPN.com, you are constantly putting up draft content, which includes, most recently, your updated big board. which Every Friday. Yep. Every Friday. Okay, so you're updating every Friday, Mel. And I would just be, before we get into some of the players uh, and just the various changes, how, is it, does it change much in your, in, in your mind week to week or... Is it more sort of alterations, tiny adjustments for players here or there? Yes, tweaks, field, and what it's based off of, so everybody understands what we're doing here, it's based on looking at the film from past weeks, but it reacting also to what happened that previous week. Sure. So, you know, I, I try to make it based on both aspects of evaluating a player. And so, yeah, you'll always have two to three to four, sometimes five, six players. The top 10 positional rankings will change. And now we obviously are in a position where we're trying to say, okay, who's going back? Should I take Shador Sanders? I've had him up there all year. Should I just take him out? Because it looks like he's returning to Colorado, but he has not announced it yet. Carson Beck, quarterback, Georgia, one year as a starter, really good year. Should I take him out of the top tens? Because it looks like he could go back to Georgia. So we're waiting on all that, but it's fluid. But I do basically every week have, I wouldn't say significant changes, but tweaks to the top tens and certainly to the top 25 big board. Yeah, Mel, I'll say this, and this is just my experience. This is, you know, year one for me doing this full Monty. You you are the person that created this industry over 40 years ago. So you've got this, I'm sure, as efficiently as anybody can do it. But I'm realizing that, like, you just can't watch every player every week, right? So Mm -hmm. there are times where the alterations to your big board are a reflection of, hey, I didn't get the chance to watch this guy over the past couple of weeks because there's only, I don't know, 500 players that you are evaluating for the upcoming draft. And by the way, that's a conservative amount. Mm -hmm. So there are times where you just haven't had the chance to go back and watch that, you know, that guard from Oregon or that cornerback from NC State, and you haven't seen him in two or three weeks, and all of a sudden he's made a hard charge positively or has kind of fallen off negatively, and as a result of that, up or down a few spots on the board. What I figured I would do is it's top 25 are available right now on ESPN.com, also broken down by position group. But let's focus in on those top 25 and kind of take it five players at sure. a time, Mel. Yeah. Uh, seems like a nice, easy way to break it yeah. up. And I'll read the first five just so the people that haven't seen it already on ESPN.com are aware of it. And then I'll kind of poke and prod as needed at the top. Probably not quite as much um, consternation, Mel, because obviously nearly usually at the top, you have a just you know a firmer grip on who those guys have been for quite some time. It's Caleb Williams, quarterback from USC, Marvin Harrison Jr., wide receiver from Ohio State, Drake Bay, quarterback, North Carolina. Brock Bowers, tight end from Georgia. And then Roma Dunze, wide receiver from Washington. Kale has been there forever, man. Nothing really to ask there. Marvin Harrison Jr. is who he is. I think three through five are where things get a bit more interesting. Is there a sizable gap between Marvin Harrison Jr. and Drake May? Because we know that quarterbacks will end up going higher than where they are graded. But if Marvin Harrison is that many cuts above Drake May, could we say Marvin Harrison going number two overall if it's a team like, for example... Arizona with that second pick. Definitely we could. I think you can make an argument that Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best player in a draft and certainly the best player in most drafts. But you have Caleb Williams there who, outside of the Notre Dame game with the three picks, was the big hiccup in his year. Kind of the game you say, let's just throw it out. 
Let's mm-hmm. say it's one game. It was a bad game for Caleb against Notre Dame. Things didn't go his way. But overall, the last two years, he's been phenomenal. So he's cemented it, number one. I really thought, Field, Drake May would challenge Caleb Williams. But mm-hmm. it didn't happen. And you go back to the NC State game. You go back to the Virginia game, the Clemson yeah. game. There, there were some missed throws, some missed opportunities, some errant throws, some inaccurate throws where there were no reason for that shouldn't happen, but he had a new coordinator, new receivers. Yeah. So you got to factor that in. I, I think, and he's young. You know, think about you know, age of Drake May. He's 21, turns 22 in August. So he'll be yeah. 21 when the draft takes place. All those factors make you give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. But I do think it's going to be interesting. We'll get to the next group, which includes Jaden Daniels, yeah. who could challenge maybe Drake May. But of that top group, I think Romo Dunze, I'm excited about. Because yeah. I, I saw consistency week in and week out. You didn't have Jalen McMillan. He was hurt early on. He was a heck of a receiver, came back late, and really finished strong. But that whole uh, in middle period, they didn't have McMillan. Yet he was able to go out and consistently get open and make big plays week after week. And he's going to test off the chart. So I think Romo Dune say to me, if it wasn't a Marvin Harrison in most years, he would be wide receiver one, I think, for everybody. Yeah, and Romo Dunze, by the way, like if you find a wide receiver characteristic that you care about, Rome does it pretty well, right? Like there are certain things that maybe Malik Neighbors is faster, maybe Marvin Harrison has a slightly better catch radius, whatever it might be, but Rome does everything really well. And I understand that playing with a quarterback like Michael Penix Jr., the second place finisher in this year's Heisman Trophy, helps Roma Dunze. But to your point, Mel, there are two other wide receivers on that Washington offense that are going to get drafted and probably fairly high as well. Jalen Hyatt, the third, uh, who we have not yet mentioned. And every week, whether it was a good opponent, bad opponent, whether it was an absolute deluge like the game against Oregon State, Robodunze kept producing. He just yep. kept making that offense click throughout mm-hmm. the entirety of the season. Penix was unbelievable, remarkable, but he had a little bit of a skid there down the stretch that might have been mm-hmm. the difference, by the way, between he and Jaden Daniels as the eventual Heisman Trophy yep. winner. I can't wait to ask you about Jaden because <laughs> we might already be on slightly different wavelengths there. Not yep. Not totally there yet, but uh, we're, we're, we're at least trending in that direction. Okay. Brock Bowers. Here's what I ask you about Brock Bowers. And I think you'll, you'll, you will not find a single person who has evaluated Brock Bowers that would feel as though he's an outstanding player because there's so much to like about him. And a guy who came back from an injury during the season, Mel, mm-hmm. and like right away had some shades of the old Brock Bowers, even if he was perhaps like, you know, five or 10% less explosive mm-hmm. because of that ankle injury that he was dealing with. I think the question that I'm going to have to ask during the pre-draft process is philosophically, how mm-hmm. high can we rate a tight end given the fact that there have been recent tight ends that have gone very high yeah. that have not necessarily provided the same immediate impact of other players drafted in the first five or 10 picks? Great point, uh, Field. I was talking uh, this morning uh, you know, with, with ESPN Radio, with Michelle and with, with Evan and with, uh, with Chris Canty uh, on the morning show. And it was, it was about the fact that George Kittle, Mark Andrews, yeah. and who was the third? Uh, oh, Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey, of course, yeah. All third, fourth, fifth round draft picks. Sure. So the, the great tight ends in the NFL or receivers in the NFL from that position you can move around didn't go in the first or second round. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't prevent you from grading a player. And Brock Bowers is going to be a heck of a player in the NFL. Uh, and unfortunately, they didn't have a healthy Brock Bowers or a healthy lad McConkey at the end of the year, ready when they needed him the most. But uh, to me, what Brock does in terms of we're talking about consistency over the period of years and game in and game out and his effort and the way he catches the ball and the way he can run after the catch and the one game, I, you know, the speed that he showed after the catch, the determination, everything about him is conducive to success and will lead to success in the NFL. Uh, I think in terms of the, you know, the fact that we have my push him up too high uh, where I did, I just looked at a guarantee. You know yeah. what you're getting as opposed to some other guys who there's maybe a higher ceiling, but a little bit of a bust factor. With totally, Brock, yeah. You're going to get a guy, you know you're what you're getting. You know you're going to get production. You know you're going to get immediate return on your investment. You're going to get who's going to be giving it everything he has every time he's out there, practice field, game day, everywhere. So that's why I probably moved him up a little higher than maybe some people have him. Yeah, I think the floor is just so immensely high for, for Brock Bowers. And by the way, I remember him coming back and one of the first games back was Auburn. And he makes a catch over the middle of the field with one hand. And you're just like, wow, that was amazing. And then the exact, the, the very next play, Mel, he makes an even better catch once again. And you're just like, oh, I'm reminded of why this player is regarded as such a high uh, high, high floor prospect. I think the, um, the to me, the path for Brock Bowers, if he goes in the top five, eight, ten picks, would be one of these teams 
maybe the New York Jets is an example, who has a, a, a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback, but is drafting higher than they should because of circumstances like the Jets, right? Obviously, Aaron Rodgers gets injured. He goes to New York, they could have a monster season right away, where I think uh, NFL teams, I think, are, have to make a calculation is if you're in the top 10, it, it might well be because you either have a quarterback issue or you have a playmaker's issue. How many offenses can be run through the tight end is their number one passing game option, which is a question that Brock Bowers and the team that drafts him may have to answer, but he's an awesome player. I mean, we're nitpicking here at the very top tight end, number one player, number four for you overall, let's go to six through 10. And you mentioned Jaden Daniels, obviously a part of this six through 10 group, but not before Shador Sanders, Olu Fashanu from uh, Penn state, the left tackle, very, very, very good player. Jaden Daniels, Malik neighbors, and then Leia Tulatu, the outside linebacker and pass rusher from yep. UCLA, who had just a monster, monster season for the Bruins here. Uh, Shadur Mel, you already mentioned, like th there's a chance he returned. It certainly seems like the prevailing thought is he will return to Colorado for one more season. So let's get through the rest of this top 10. And I want to ask you about Jaden Daniels then, because you did talk about it a little bit. He has made as hard of a charge as I think probably anybody in the draft this year uh, in terms of boosting his stock. By the time we get to April, are we sure that we won't be talking about Jaden Daniels, the second player drafted in the entire proceedings? He could. I mean, the, what he did, I mean, people were, I would say, late to the party, but you had to be a little hesitant based on last year. There's some things he had to get his eyes up, see the field. You know, that, again, you talk about toughness, he proved that. You talk about decision making, you talk about managing a game, yet being aggressive with his mm. legs, with his arm, taking those shots, letting it rip, and be able to balance out aggressiveness, yet don't turn the ball over. Yeah. And he didn't. I mean, it's amazing. 57 touchdown passes, only seven picks the last two years, Field. Ridiculous. Over the last two years, he's at 70.2 completion percentage. Yeah. This year was an 11-7 per pass attempt, number one in the nation. He was at 8-4 per carry, 10 rushing touchdowns. Yeah. The, the toughness he showed, and one thing late in the year, I heard him say it was said that he beat Brian Kelly to the office on a regular basis. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Now, to me, that's number one on the list of priority for a quarterback. Competitiveness, yeah. we get into that. We talk about Josh Allen. We see Will Levis, the way he competes on the football field. Yeah. Competitiveness. Everybody plays football is competitive field. Yeah. But the level of competitiveness, who's the 10, who's the five. So it's not a knock. Everybody puts that uniform on, is more competitive than anybody in this world, right? Sure. But when they're out on that field, there's levels of competitiveness. Yeah. Jaden showed this year that he is highly, highly competitive and wants to be great yeah. and will do what it takes to get his weight up to 206, yet also being at, in that film room and studying the opponent, getting better, trying to figure out what he needs to do. So from that standpoint, Herm Edwards recruited him and coached him. Yeah. Herm yeah. on Loves the Monday him. Blitz compared him to Randall Cunningham. Wow. Now, you think about the league, you think about what we need, dual threat. Yep. Yeah. Uh, to me, Jay, the actors now, you say, hey, Brian Thomas Jr. and Malik Neighbors helped him out a lot, right? Lacey as well. Some good players mm -hmm. around. But the O-line wasn't great. He didn't have, you know, to me, he did some things that when bro it broke down, the, the ability to run around, elude, evade, and run through contact field was really impressive. I kept moving him up to the point where I, I waited. I didn't want to put him in a 25 prematurely. So I want to see what Michael Penix did, Bo Nix did, and let it really shake out what Shador going to do. How's he? And then when I said, we're going to, I put him in a top 10 because yeah. to me, it, you know, what's he lacking? And, and I'll go to you, Phil. What concerns you with him? Am I too high on him? No. I don't look at anybody else's ratings field. I don't yeah. want to know anybody's else. Already. You're telling me what you have for the first time. Matt Miller, Jordan Reed, for the first time when we talk, will tell me what they think. I'll be curious, where do you have him on your board and what do you think about Jaden Daniels right now? My first top 25 will come out, I think, right after the uh, college football okay. national championship. So we're still about a month or so away mm -hmm. from that. I mm -hmm. believe Jaden Daniels will be one of my five top players. And I think he'll be okay. the second, he'll be the second quarterback in my rankings, behind only, of course, Caleb Williams. And if you ask, so let's talk about the concerns. If there are concerns for Jaden Daniels, I think the one that people are going to latch on to the most during the pre-draft process, Mel, is he had to get up to 206 pounds, right? We're just, what, 10 months removed from dissecting Bryce, way, uh, Bryce Young's weight left and right and left and right. Now, Jaden, obviously much taller, so you're not dealing with the concerns about seeing over the offensive line or being able to throw past, you know, the, the branches of these defensive linemen putting their arms up in the air. Probably the fact that uh, he's a little bit lighter, and if you are a running quarterback, taking big hits, obviously, that frame comes uh, into focus a little bit further. 
Some might have an issue with the fact that he is going to be 23 years old. He already is. He turned 23 three days ago, Mel, a little bit older than Drake May, who, as you mentioned, turned uh, 21. They're 20 months apart. Uh, so Drake has the nearly two-year, I guess, advantage over Jaden Daniels. I'd also point to the fact that I'm not saying he's this type of player stylistically. Joe Burrow, 23 years old, actually older than Jaden Daniels when he was drafted. I think Cincinnati has no concern about the fact that they took a 23-year-old number one overall, especially because quarterbacks are playing so routinely now in their mid-30s, even late 30s in the cases of a lot of guys, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, into their 40s. Yeah. Um, and with Jaden, you mentioned the, top, the the wide receivers. They're tremendous. And I get that. And I understand that you always have to do your best to, to dissect the quarterback from the receivers and the receivers from the quarterback. But there was a lot that did let LSU down this year. The offensive line, as you mentioned, very, very young. The defense was terrible, right? The competition every week in, in the SEC, every single week, especially in that SEC West, is as stiff as there is for any quarterback in the country. And there were games that LSU was put on the back of Jaden Daniels, and he carried them to victory. And we talk about clutch production. Think about all the one-score games this season, Mel. There was a time, I think it was like three weeks ago, we were already like at the record number of games decided by one score, like let's call it week 11, through week 11 in NFL history. All these one-score games, you ask me who has shown more in pivotal moments this year, and I don't care whether it's Jaden Daniels versus Drake May or Jaden Daniels versus anybody, nobody has done more in big moments than Jaden Daniels. The Missouri game, they have no business winning that game. They end up putting up 49 points, including a late touchdown from Jaden Daniels. Florida game where he accounts for 300 yards, almost 300 yards as a runner. It's unbelievable five-touchdown performance. I get it. Florida was not a dominant program this year, but they were whooping up on LSU in portions, uh, at least that LSU defense for portions of that game. There was a lot of responsibility put on Jaden Daniels' back, and he met the moment basically every single Saturday. I get it. They didn't win the, 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 the division. They lost to Alabama. But like there were games that they either were in or should not have won that they did only because of Jaden Daniels. Yeah, an experience field. That's the whole tough part of evaluating because there's always going to be a negative to a positive, right? Sure. So you have, I can give you a positive, but you can spin it and say it's a negative. Yeah. I've always been there so long. Somebody was telling me this last past week, well, you got to be careful of the older guys because they're more experienced, they're mature, mm -hmm. they played so much football, they got a big advantage over the college football players. And they go, well, before we were talking about the Parcells rule with X amount of starts this year, yeah. they come in at young age, only X amount of starts, you're not going to do, do as well. Brock Purdy was Mr. Irrelevant. We kept yeah. saying, Brock Purdy, has he been at Iowa State 10 years? It seems like, is Brock Purdy ever going to leave Iowa State? He had yeah. 46 career starts, 48 games he played in field, and it helped him, right? Will totally. Levis was 24 years of age, right? He's 24 right now. Okay, yeah. that hurt him. Okay, you mentioned Joe Burrow. You know, Joe Burrow had great players around him at LSU when he won at national title. Did that assist Joe? Sure it did. But has it prevented him from being a great quarterback in the NFL? No, it has not. So I think you look at last year, C.J. Trout was the youngest. He's coming in and done great. Okay, yep. Levis was one of the old ones. He's coming in and done really well. It, it, at the end of the day, it hasn't mattered, really. Yeah. It really hasn't mattered. Right. Um, to your point about Jaden and the clutch performances, he needed on those drives. He knew, I got to score on this drive. I got to score on this next drive. Yep. I can't, our defense can't stop anybody. So, sure. again, I think the pressure, we saw that with Levis on Monday night, bringing his team back, mm -hmm. getting the ball in your hands and needing to make those throws and direct that team down the field in the final minutes of the game. He made history. Two yep. touchdowns in the final three minutes. Something that the team hadn't done in a long time, right? So, again, it's been, what, 700 games? We've got game, how many play games in between before that happened? So, to me, I think that's critical. And then you get into Drake May. Mm. Drake May could have maybe challenged Caleb, but he fell back a bit. Yeah. Jaden now, could he challenge Drake May? It seems like what you, what you said just now, you're going to have Jaden now as ahead of Drake May. Yeah. I am. Yes, I am. I am. And I know that's probably going to uh, light a fire under some people's uh, butts uh, when they read that for the first time here, Mel. Um, and, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, I'm not going to take a victory lap if Jaden Daniels ends up getting drafted ahead of Drake May, because as we know, like just because one team who has a pick higher than somebody else sees it a certain way doesn't mean that the whole league does. But um, I think Dre offers, Drake offers so much. And at the beginning of the, actually before you and I were talking, uh, offline, we were talking. I was talking about how, like, one of the challenges is how when you put a player ahead of another great player, it is often only viewed through the prism of, well, what do you hate about that guy that you have ranked lower? And sometimes it's not just about that. Sometimes it's about the fact that the other player who you have ranked higher 
is just phenomenal. But I do think there were moments this year where I felt like Drake May left me wanting more. And I get it. Wide receiver room until Tez Walker showed up, of course, had that weird situation with being ineligible for about half the season, was not nearly the group that uh, someone like Jaden Daniels is playing with. But I also think it's a different conference, right? The strength of schedule that he's facing every single, like you were talking about, like, you know, games against like, you know, Duke and Appalachian State and, you know, teams that I think if they go to the SEC are probably, you know, very much the bottom feeders of that conference. So uh, the challenges that Jaden faced every single week, and while Drake May is an excellent runner, he led North Carolina in rushing back in 2022, uh, Jaden is by far the most dynamic runner of any quarterback that's going to be drafted high in this year's class. So Jaden offers that dual threat versatility. Uh, we're going to have plenty of Lamar Jackson comparisons, Mel, just because of the fact that he is such a phenomenal athlete. I don't think he's as athletic as Lamar. I think he's probably a more refined passer coming out of college than Lamar was. Uh, but because of that, because of how the draft process works and people loving comparisons, you're going to hear a lot of that. And I think more and more, I am interested in players at the top of the draft board of quarterback that are stealing razors and potential grand slams. And I think Jaden Daniels this year, screamed to me ceiling razor and potential grand slam in a way that drake may at moments did but did not do consistently enough yeah and i remember then the comps and i'm not big on comps field but they yeah. they play a part we all do it i think when you do it publicly you got it but we all do it privately we all say, yep. i see a little bit of him in this guy's the justin herbert comparison is going to be out there for drake may mm -hmm. kind of looks like him the yeah delivery everything about him the is number it's all it's all yeah. there right Everything's there for the comp to be Justin Herbert. And I remember when Justin Herbert played Oregon and Bo Nix's first start was against was Auburn against Oregon. Yep. And Justin drove him, they got him down there, final minutes, and they had one play. And he throws, he's like the 30-yard line of Auburn, throws the ball out of the end zone. Yeah. Okay. I mean, then he doesn't even chance. I think like, yep. put the ball in play, Justin. You put the sure. ball in play. So we nitpick about things. I was sitting there saying, you, why couldn't you put that ball in play? Yep. Every team is shot. And we've seen one thing that we, if we're going to critique Justin's career so far, it's that finishing, getting the ball in your hands. Yep. We talked about with a rookie Levis who didn't even play in the preseason, played one preseason game. It was yep. the third quarter. He's out there Monday night against Miami on the road on a Monday night, getting it done. Yeah. So Justin has had the ball in his hands, needing field goal, touchdown, and it hadn't happened. So again, for Justin to get over, and I said this morning, I think Jim Harbaugh, talk about putting a coach with it. But if Jim Harbaugh is going to put him with, with Justin Herbert, you know, Ooh, he, was, yeah. he, he was with Josh Johnson at the university of San Diego, what he yep. did at Stanford, what he did with Colin Kaepernick with the 49ers getting to the Super Bowl, what he's doing with JJ McCarthy, who we haven't talked about yet at Michigan, Jim Harbaugh at, at, with the chargers would be an ideal fit. We'll see. I mean, Staley still has a job. Obviously. He's still the head coach. But we're talking about sure. Jim Harbaugh with Carolina, Chicago, all these different possibilities that could happen for Jim Harbaugh. If he left Michigan, uh, the chargers with Herbert, we'll see, but the Herbert Drake make comparison is going to be out there. And I don't really have a problem with it. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, the, the comparison game is a little bit of a dangerous one because uh, as we know, there's only 32 starting quarterbacks. So it's possible for each of them to be unique from the other one, but I am bracing for the Lamar talk with Jaden Daniels and the Justin Herbert talk for Drake May. I love both of those players. I just, I think that as the, as the process has worn on and every week that went by, and obviously LSU is down to just a bowl game left over Mel, everything that Jaden Daniels could have done on the field to improve his draft stock and cement his his case as a potential NFL superstar, I think he did. And I think that there's something to be said for a guy meeting the moment consistently and how that may bear out at the NFL level. Now, just to put a little exclamation point on this, Jalen, Jaden Daniels thought about coming out last year. Yeah. Seriously about coming out last year. He would Glad not have been a first, second round pick last year. Sure. Okay, so you're talking about a kid who made a great decision. Think mm -hmm. about Heisman Trophy, Johnny Unitas Golden Arm Award, all the other awards that he won, in addition to being a top five, top ten pick in the first round, would not have happened. He'd be more prepared for the NFL based on the way yep. he played, the way he got better. You can't get better in the NFL when you're the third-string quarterback. It's yep. hard to get better. Very hard. Totally. Play. So playing, Roy, so for anybody listening that has kids, you can advise, encourage, go back, get as much experience, and Jaden Daniels, could have been sitting there as a forgotten man in the NFL, off the radar, trying to figure it out. And look what he accomplished. The I saw I, when I talked to his mom, I said, "Don't ever have any regrets. No, don't you have any regrets? Get a win-win. 
If right. I go back to LSU, it's a win-win. I can maybe win some awards. If I don't, I'm getting better. Then go into the NFL. So, again, no regrets, win-win. I, I congratulate him on a great – you also congratulate him and his family on making one of the best decisions any college football player's made in a long time. No two ways about that. He's been unbelievable every step of the way during this past year. And, uh, you know, talking to people around the program, talking to our, our colleagues here at ESPN, Booger McFarland, obviously, uh, a very proud LSU alumni, he's talked about how, like, Jaden Daniels in week one – of the 2022 season is a different player than where he is now. You talk about it. Like people will say, well, you know, how much better can you get if you're entering the NFL at 23? The answer is a lot. There's a ton of room for growth, even at the age of 23, which is old. I'm using air quotes here for those listening on audio for NFL rookie standards. So I just think the improvement has really uh, caught my attention enough that uh, I'm going to have a very, very thoughtful sort of debate in my head. And I think right now the lean is Jaden Daniels as my second quarterback, on my big board, which will be out probably in about four weeks from right okay. now. We're going to pick 11 through 15, Mel, and I'll kind of maybe loop uh, pick 10 just one more time. Leia Tulatu, uh, outside linebacker, pass rusher from UCLA, had a remarkable year this past year. Dallas Turner, number 11, pass rusher slash everything for Alabama. Keon Coleman, Florida State wide receiver. Cooper Jean, uh, I would call him also everything. Defensive back for uh, Iowa, suffered a big injury at the end of the season. Does not sound like it's going to impact his like training camp availability, but uh, cost him what, two or three games, including their uh, bi their Big Ten championship game against Michigan. Troy Fatanu, the uh, left tackle for Washington. Uh, and then Joe Alt at number 15, the left tackle from Notre Dame, who just hours before you and I have this conversation, Mel, uh, did decide to declare for the draft. No surprise there. I want to start at the top and kind of use this as like a springboard. Lea Tulatu from UCLA, um, the highest rated defensive player on the board with two others mentioned, Dallas Turner and Cooper DeGene in this cluster. Um, is the fact that a defensive player not coming off the board until or not being on your board till 10 a reflection of a bad defensive class or more just a really, really strong offensive class? I don't think the defensive players lived up to the hype from August mm. or the projections we had. OK, yep. some of the guys were OK, good, but they weren't spectacular to earn a top 10 grade. Lots well, of when you think about the injury at Washington goes to UCLA and kind of says, okay, I'm healthy, I'm fine, the injury is a thing of the past. Just like Jalen, Jalen remember Phillips, Jalen Phillips did it. Same thing, Going yep. from UCLA uh, Miami, to yeah. Miami. So he left UCLA to Miami and made himself a first-round pick and made that injury was significant, a thing of the past. Latu went from Washington to UCLA and with the mm. Bruins made it a thing of the past. And I'm telling you, Phil, no pass rusher I watched this year in college football got it. He understands how to utilize – and change up his pass rush moves, adjust on the fly, close, bend, quickness, everything about being a pass rusher he has. Yep. And that's why he was consistent week in and week out. And yet he, and then Gabriel Murphy on the other side opened up opportunities for him as he had, had a really good year on the opposite side of, of that UCLA defense getting after the quarterback. For well, I do, If the medical comes out okay, and we'll all hear other stuff come combine time. But to me, pass rusher-wise, he was the best in the country week in and week out. Most nuanced for sure, to your point of skill. Like, you know, I think athletically, if you put him and Dallas Turner and a couple and Jared Verse and a few others in, in the NFL combine, Latu may have the least impressive numbers, right? But in terms of like if it was a pass rush summit, Latu was leaps and bounds better than really anybody in the country. The sack production really showed up. And just for those that don't really know his story, Latu started his career at Washington and then medically retired. He was done playing football and was out for a year and a half, basically, and then was able to resume his career because of this neck injury, uh, was cleared to play at UCLA, as Mel mentioned. Uh, so this is a comeback story, but as Mel also referenced, with Jalen Phillips, nobody doubted the talent of Jalen Phillips a few years ago. It was that some doctors were not comfortable signing off on Jalen Phillips coming out of Miami after he was forced to retire at UCLA. So uh, I they no matter... What happens over the next four and a half months prior to the draft? One thing I'll remain consistent on with Latu is that there are some things that you and I may not be privy to within a team's facility that's going to influence their decision and their evaluation of Latu more so than any other prospect that we, we, we are at least aware of right now because neck injuries are not one to be messed around with. Uh, but he is the top defensive player in your rankings. Uh, he and Dallas Turner will be an interest. I think the the, the debate there, Mel, is going to be ceiling versus floor to bring that that contract in yeah. once again, right? Because I think Leia Tulatu, if he played, to, you know, if you, if you told him we're going to be three practices to get you ready on Sunday, he'd probably get an NFL sack. He's that sort of nuanced, skilled, uh, it just advanced, right? 
But Dallas Turner, if you told me which of those guys has a better chance to become like a five-time Pro Bowler, I think it's Turner because of the unique athletic traits. Am I seeing it differently than you? No, I, and Turner did. Uh, I thought played better and got better as the year went along. Chris Braswell on the other side did a really good job. But you're right, that's going to be a battle we'll follow throughout. The other battle and doing the, the next tier is that wide receiver battle a- after Marvin Harrison Jr. Because we have Malik yeah. Neighbors and we have Keon Coleman. And there's going to be opinions all over the place because Malik Neighbors, to me, has special qualities. And the special. one thing I love, and on the field, I love what I saw. But when you hear him say, Hey, in Louisiana, when Jaden came here, we're a little different down here in Louisiana. Yeah. You play through injuries, ankle, tape it up and go out and play. Toughness to deal with things. He had some a play here, mistake here, and he comes back. He still gets it done last year. He had the fumble punt. And all. So, again, Malik Neighbors is a special kid. Keon Coleman is a special talent who yes. was quiet in some games, had some drops, uh, talent off the charts. Keon Coleman is really interesting. And, and I think that debate between Odunze, Coleman, Neighbors is going to be fascinating moving forward. But I think the way I line them up right now is Odunze, Neighbors, then Coleman. Yep. And you can't forget about this other group of receivers like Adonai Mitchell from yep. Texas, Xavier Worthy from Texas. I mentioned McConkey, yep. Xavier Leggett from South Carolina is a really good yeah. player. Brian Thomas Jr. too. Right? Brian Thomas Jr., the other receiver we talked about with his – you talk about catch radius, the size, and the way he plays. To me, this receiver group is the best in the draft. I think you could have field, I'll just say, an over-under for wide receivers in round one. I'll ask you this. If I set the over-under for wide receivers at mm-hmm. five and a half, six, yep. what would you do? If, I would take the over. I think it's I think it's a six wide receiver first round. Now, there's four that are locks. All right, you talked about them. Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, and Keon Cole. Lock, stone cold. I would bet my money on it. I bet my mortgage on it right now. Then between the players that you just laid out, if you told me just, and this is the the the, the trick of doing grades as, as round grades. If you ask me, does Brian Thomas Jr. look like a first round pick? Yes. Does A.D. Mitchell look like a first round pick? Yes. Does Xavier Leggett look like a first round pick? Yes. Does Lab McConkey look like a first round pick? Yes. That's, that's four more on top of the four that we started with. That's eight right there. Does that mean that all eight will go in the first round? No, because obviously they're going to be teams that don't necessarily have as pressing of a need for wide receiver. Xavier Worthy, another one that obviously is going to generate that kind of conversation, Mel. But I think the answer is six plus because, I mean, there are other spots in this draft that just leave a lot to be desired. Um, and I think that the wide receiver gap, they're going to be plugged in. And as we're seeing right now, Mel, it's a quarterback-driven league, but – a guy like Tyreek Hill is showing us that an outstanding wide receiver, and Debo Samuel over the past few weeks, like those guys can change the offense in a major material way. And what I think is cool about this wide receiver class is you kind of have a little bit of everything, right? If you put Lad McConkey and lined him up next to Xavier Leggett or A.D. Mitchell, there's no way. I mean, McConkey and, and, and Mitchell were teammates in Georgia for a couple of years there. Those guys are like different, like a whole different body types, right? But both of them get the job done at an incredibly high level, which is why I think each could very well be a top 32 pick this year. Great points, Field. And I'll tell you, this other wide receiver that we haven't even mentioned, and Malachi Corley of Western Kentucky. Love him. Yep. Because he was so good after the catch. He's going to go back to Tom's Debo. Samuel Comp is That's pretty the obvious. Yep. But Malachi Corley at Western Kentucky is interesting. And, and you know about the transfers. A.D. Mitchell, Adnan Mitchell goes Georgia to Texas. Yep. Jermaine Burton went. Georgia to Alabama. And Jermaine yep. Burton so much better this year, even though his numbers actually were good this year, catching the football so consistently, making big plays for Milrow. I think he was very improved. You think about other receivers in this draft, Ricky Pearsall yeah, in Florida. Florida. I mean, he may go third round. I mean, he's a nice player. He's going to help yep. you right. He was formerly of Arizona State. Yep. Another transfer, Johnny Wilson, 6'7", frame at Florida State, the other receiver with Keon Coleman. I go on a lot because we can spend a whole podcast on – why Troy Franklin, names, Oregon, right? Names are, yeah. Those guys I gave you are really good football players. Yeah, J. Michael Sturdivant, there's a million of them from UCLA, obviously, formerly of Cal. There's so many wide receivers in this year's draft class. We will do a specific wide receiver. We should just do a, a day of just watching wide receiver tape together, Mel, because it is, and well, you've been doing this forever. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still my, I'm the newbie around here, but uh, I got a feeling that this might set an unrealistic bar for future wide receiver draft classes because it is plentiful. Um, all right, so I, we, I, I told we, we, we get through 25 and we're not quite there yet. So I want to ask you, I want to clean up one player from sure. the first 15. It's Joel. And I think 15 is lower than some uh, would view him right now, Mel. 
Uh, and when I say some, I'm, I'm not referring to like NFL scouts and GMs because, you know, that, that's a, a separate conversation we can have. But I'm just talking about there's so many people that have followed the the, the, the trail blazed by you, Mel Kuyper Jr., uh, becoming a draft analyst. And I think some people say oh, that's a top five, top eight, top 10 player, 15, maybe lower than the Internet would suggest. Again, you don't bother with the Internet very much. But, Joe, well, why 15? Basically because eight to 15 have the similar grade. So you're yeah. really splitting hairs there. So you would say gotcha. 15, it could be eight, could be nine. It's gotcha. very similar grade. I mean, based on they're almost have the same grade. You know, it's just when you stack them up, it's basically how I put them in. Yeah, okay. I, mean, I could have very easily put all the little higher. So there's really, I'm, I'm not, we're not really on a different page there, even though it may look like it because it. the grades are such so close. And basically they're the same between eight and 15. There's yeah. nothing different there. And I put Troy Fatanu in there because I love the way he plays. I love the versatility as a left tackle who will be a, and don't write off, right tackle for him oh, i think yeah, like he could that. be a right tackle. he's still developing he's still getting better and he loves the he is so to steal booger mcfarland physicality of troy fatano is off yeah. the charts of what he did in the pac-12 championship game so i have him slightly ahead of all but as far as tackles go i think he's going to stack up right there near the top it, again i watched him i'm a big Notre Dame fan i watched him oh maybe i watched him too much you know i i like joe wall there's not his father you know what, what he did in the nfl of course yeah <laughs> John Oden, Iowa. So the bloodlines are strong. You know, he's a good football player. His great, I could have put him at eight, like said, eight and 15, really eight down to 17. I don't know if I'm 17. Uh, it's, uh, it's Johnny Newton from Illinois. Right. Yep. Are very, are basically, like I say, splitting hairs field. Yeah, it's important to think about draft grades sometimes, Mel, in terms of like tiers or buckets, right? Like a lot of NFL teams will throw guys just into like these big buckets of like, you know, some will be first round. Some will say like, all right, here's blue chip at the very top. Some will do it numerically. Here's a 10. Here's a nine. Here's an eight. So it's almost like you have to think of it like you just said, eight through 15 are pretty similar. It's like they're all eights. Somebody has to be the top of the eight. Somebody has to be the bottom of the eight. So I know people get very hung up on (laughs) why do you have this guy ahead of that guy? But there is sometimes, um, you know, sometimes the difference is is, as thin as, you know, as as a pin. And uh, that's the reason why a player drops a little bit lower. But I do I do love Joel, who, by the way, as I mentioned, he declared a few a few hours ago. He's 20 mil. It's crazy. He's 20. He was a high school tight end and tackle like for him to be this like composed is what I say is a left tackle. Like he's, he's huge. He's six foot eight, all of it and 322 pounds. But to be that composed and like that, I would say um, like understanding of what it takes to be a left tackle after barely playing it. Very, very, very impressive, which takes us to. And really quick field. You Go mentioned ahead, yes. the, 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 the other players at that tackle spot are, are pretty good as well. I mean, Jordan yep. Morgan at Arizona is a really nice player. And yep. I think, into the depth of that spot. There's going to be some intriguing guys that we may have a little bit of a difference of opinion on, but Jordan Morgan from Arizona will get to, he's at the bottom end, but that offensive tackle group to try to separate after that top elite group. Like I said, a Fatano could be a right tackle. He's going to be projected by most to be a guard, but I think if you need him to kick out the, the right tackle and you do need that. I mean, there are games where guys get hurt. Yeah. You know, offensive lines. And if you can have that dual versatility to be a, a you know, don't write him off a tackle because yeah. uh, he more than held his own at left tackle for Washington oh. and did a good job. So like, to me, I think Fatanu is a guy that I don't. I might have him higher than a lot of people. I don't know. Field, you can tell me. Do I have Fatanu higher than you do? The the twenty five is is still a work in progress, but Fatanu is higher on your board than he will be on. Okay. Mine. Yes, I thought he but, would be because I, yeah. I thought he would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but you know, I think it takes a certain selflessness to uh, change positions in the pros and do it uh, without any sort of pushback. But think about how much better the Lions are for Panay Sewell's selflessness to yep. become a right tackle. Like yep. he could be a Pro Bowl left tackle and said, "I'm cool with it." Team captain, Pro Bowl right tackle, guy's going to make a, a billion dollars when he's extension eligible mm-hmm. after the season. That to me is a, that's a high football character player right there. Yeah. Uh, 16 through 20, Jared Verse, Talia Sifuaga from the uh, Oregon State, one of two tackles from Oregon State. They'll be drafted, but the higher one for sure. Uh, Johnny Jerzon Newton, Jerzon Johnny Newton, I should say, from Illinois, the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, Marius Mims, right tackle from Georgia, and then Xavier Worthy, wide receiver from Texas. Uh, of those five, uh, who was the most enjoyable player to watch out of those five for you, Mel? Oh, boy, I'll tell you. Newton on the right day, is uh, he gets after it. He can get after the quarterback. Fuaga is a guy, you know, at Oregon State, I just like them. I may have him a little higher, but I just like the way he yeah, yeah. got, got after people. So I'm probably a little higher on him. Mims with the injury is a tough one because you saw him when he was healthy, played really good, and showed great. I thought it could be this year's Broderick Jones. The injury right. prevented that from happening. 
to me, when you look at Worthy, unfortunately he had the ankle injury in the Big 12 title game. He was in the booty. I hope he's healthy when they move into the playoffs. Explosive player opposite Mitchell. He was kind of a little Hollywood Brown, Zay Flowers. You saw a lot of those guys that with the ball in their hands, they're electric. So Worthy, definitely interesting. Uh, I think that that next group of players is, is really good. To go to the tackle spot, we thought defensive tackle would be probably one of the stronger positions. Yeah. Leonard Williams the third. It didn't materialize. You talk about some of the guys at the top. It just didn't happen. That's why the guy that I like is Devondre Sweat from Texas, yeah. who became a guy that could just clog the middle, got penetration, got into the backfield, wreaked havoc. So, yeah, you know, to me, and I look at teams now, you say, hey, you don't need the stay at home guy. Maybe yeah. that's true, but you got to stop the run along the interior and you got to free up linebackers. Okay. That's the problem the Ravens had this past week against the Rams. The linebackers weren't freed up, they yep. weren't occupying. So what did Ray Lewis say? Go get me a Lodi Nata. I love having right. Sam Adams and Tony Saragusa because I needed to be protected. You still, Tavondre Sweat from Texas, I put him as my second highest rated defensive tackle. Mm. I really like that kid. Yeah. And to go to Jared Verse, Jared Verse in certain games, would get after, there were games where he was handled. So he was a tough evaluation for me. But I think for the interior guys, Sweat, was the guy that really jumped out at me this year over what I saw in previous years to say, I got to get him up there. I think he's going to be a really good defensive tackle in the NFL. He's got great value because he's not just the guy who's going to stuff the run. He will get penetration for his size into the backfield. Those Oklahoma guards hated trying to block Devondre Sweat in the Red River, rival- Red River rivalry. I mean, if he gets his hands on you, Mel, it's over, right? Because no one can can hold up. No, no offensive lineman can anchor against 360 pounds in all of it uh, from Devondre Sweat. Um, I did want to say on uh, you were going through uh, just a variety of players there. Jared Verse, obviously included. I know that I mentioned how like age is less of a factor for me at the quarterback spot because those guys can play for 10, 15 years and it's pretty normal. Verse will be an interesting one. He's an old, he's a fifth year player. He went to Albany and redshirted to Albany, which I don't know how that's even possible that he can only make it to Albany and then redshirt, but still five full years in college. That might be a little bit of a difference maker for some teams. Drafting a 21-year-old like Dallas Turner versus a 23-year-old like Jared Verse matters a bit more at a position where you don't necessarily find a bunch of pass rushers continuing to play at a very, very high level into their early to mid-30s. Uh, 21 through 25 here, Mel. We can do this all day, by the way. But Kool-Aid McKentry, cornerback from Alabama, recently named an, all- named an All-American. His teammate, J.C. Latham, right tackle at Alabama, awesome player, Kamari Lassiter, from Georgia and Nate Wiggins, back-to-back corners out of Clemson, Georgia and Clemson. And then Jordan Morgan, the left tackle from Arizona, had a great year this year during an awesome season. Jed Fish did a remarkable job with that program this year. They are certainly on the up and up. Player that uh, I will be selfish here for a second, Mel, and say that when I had my first positional rankings that went up probably a month or so ago, player that I had the most immediate remorse over, and I told our, our editors, the great Dame Beavers and Ben Arla, just said, my, my goal is to not be sitting there five minutes before you guys hit publish and here are the, the 10 things I want to change. I can't promise that, but that's my goal, <laughs> was Nate Wiggins from Clemson. You got him at 24 here, uh, and you have him like the second or th- uh, third amongst your third corners. Goal, yep. um, do you view those three corners, because uh, you have Cooper DeGene. Do you think, well, actually, let me, uh, Cooper DeGene, you have him, like, are you evaluating him as a corner, a safety, or is it like the team will decide? I think the team will decide if he can be a corner. Uh, Cooper okay. DeGene, to me, uh, you know, I think corner, some think safety. All I know is he's a heck of a cover guy. And he tackles he's unbelievable, he's so yeah. Smart, so instinctive. And you know, he had the punt return against the Minnesota for the touchdown call back to the net. And battle fair catch signal was ridiculous. But he can do so many things, and you know what you're getting. So I think he's going to be ready, as you said, Field. He'll be ready to go. I think Kool-Aid. I would say grew on me. I thought it, am I overrating him a little bit? I, I don't. You got to be careful of handsy, grabby corners. Mm, yeah, I, I didn't see that as much from him. I didn't see. It. I, I thought Lasseter was really good in coverage, and, and you got to be able to turn. That's one thing. Brandon Stevens with the Baltimore Ravens really improved. He was a former running back. Yep. You know, corner at SMU. Uh, yeah, and he's at the Ravens. He frustrated. He'd be in coverage and had the guy, and he wouldn't look back and get a penalty or let the ball be caught. This year, he's improved dramatically in that regard. I think Lassiter is is glued to that receiver, and then he'll look and he'll be, play the ball. So, and, and Wiggins improved in that aspect as well. He has the length. So the length combined with the ability to play the ball, handsy grab. You see this like the one thing that drives me nuts, and I almost throw. There's a lot of things almost thrown through TVs. Okay. <laughs> is third down and long penalties on a defensive back. Ah, totally, yep. The gift first down that you didn't yep. earn, that was a little handsy, a little ticky-tack, if you want to say. Sure. The, if you're doing that in college, you've got to break that habit in the NFL. 
Mm. You got you have to. So yep. you can get away with it in college, but they don't throw flag after flag as much. But in the NFL, you see this frustrating third down penalty that kills you. Uh, totally. And I think those guys got better in those areas to allow them to be positioned where they are on the big board right now. Field. I think Nate Wiggins will end up being my highest rated corner when it's uh, when that top 25 is out here, Mel. And uh, they're all very, very good and had really strong seasons. As I mentioned, Kool-Aid was named a first-team All-American, and deservedly so. I thought that, you know, he, he's got, there, like, there are some limitations, right? He's definitely not the biggest out of those guys, right? He is, you know, he's not going to be this uh, really true impact player in the running game, which some teams really, really covet those guys that, have that Devon Witherspoon aspect to them. Mm -hmm. um, but Nate Wiggins, I'm going to make this somewhat reductive. You're six foot two, you're 190 pounds, and you might run a four three. And that right there is going to attract a lot of NFL teams to a cornerback who can cover as well. And uh, there's two plays this year that I think will help define Nate Wiggins. Uh, plays that are very similar in nature. Two separate plays, one against North Carolina, and then one, man, I was just watching it too. Why have I forgotten who was it against? Uh, but two run plays, which Nate Wiggins was on the opposite side of the field from where the run or originated. And he runs like 75 yards. And on one of the plays, he tackles the North Carolina player and res it results in a touchback for his team. Like he ta 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 tackles the North Carolina player, the one yard line ball fumbles out of bounds in the end zone. It becomes a touchback for Clemson. Next play, it was like a Miami game. And he ends up tackling the, the the back with at like the six inch line. Now they end up ruling it a touchdown. It was one of those. It's like so close, but he had no business making a play in either of those instances. And it showed off obviously the speed, which is terrific, but also the desire, the competitiveness, right? Which is the kind of stuff that as a cornerback, you need that. You also need a short memory because you're not going to win them all, especially in the age we are in right now in the NFL, when you've got guys like Tyree Kill and Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase and C.D. Lamb and A.J. Brown and all these cyborg wide receivers who are just so good, you're going to have bad days at the office, and a short memory is going to go a long way. I think Nate Wiggins has that. He had a couple other guys, you know, to, to, to pick back once you said about Kool-Aid. Opposite Kool-Aid is Terry and Arnold. Yeah, Terry and so Arnold good. is an interesting evaluation because I talk about getting handsy grabby. He will. Mm -hmm. I mean, he'll get his hands on you. He'll ride you, and he'll yeah, knowing when to do it and when to let go. He had a couple penalties. He was a little inconsistent at times in coverage, but I thought he got a lot better from last year, where he was beaten more than he was this year. Yep. He's got talent. He loves to play the game. He's very vocal. Uh, but Terry and Arnold, I think, is going to go in that second round mix. But another corner that he's at Toledo is Queen. Yes, Dunnett. my guy. Yeah, the length. Talk, if you could look at him and draw up the perfect corner for today's game, it's Quinn Mitchell. Yeah. And he's the master of the pass breakup. Uh, you know, the game against Ohio State was two years ago, bothered me a little bit, but I said I got to get over the one game thing. So, you know, just watch him week in and week out. And the way he plays, the confidence, the fact he's so smooth and what everything he does feel. Quinion Mitchell tests well with the way he looks and the way he plays. And you talk about the ability to go out week in and week out and get it done at a high level. He's going to be a guy that's going to be tough to overlook to get into the late first, early second round. Totally agree. And by the way, he had four pick sixes in one game last year. Four. Now, it, I'll be the first to tell you that those four pick sixes were kind of, you know, there were a handful of ducks there as well. But still, you got to catch it and you got to have the speed to run it back. His speed is terrific. I think he will test well once we get to Indianapolis in about two and a half months from right now. Uh, it's a it's a cornerback class that I don't think we have a Devin Witherspoon or a Christian Gonzalez in this year's class, Mel. Uh, that's, that's right. Probably stating the obvious there, but I think the depth has started to grow on me as the season has worn along. All right, we could have probably done all 25 players, broken them down individually, and taken about four hours, Mel, but I'm sure you have important things to do with the rest of your day. And uh, we, of course, have many more episodes of First Draft coming around the corner. But I got to tell you, this was fun, Mel. The world misses hearing you in podcast form. I just want to know when's your first mock draft is coming out, Phil. Ooh, I, I, they, they did tell me this recently. I want to okay. say it was like February 1st or something. Oh, really? I, but I, you know what, though? I've been working on it already in my own brain. Uh, it's a little tough for obviously not having the draft order. But what a fascinating dilemma the Chicago Bears have right now, Mel, because they're all of a sudden playing some pretty darn good football. And I don't know. I don't, I don't believe Justin Fields is a top 10 quarterback. I'm not sure that I see the uh, the path to him being a top 10 quarterback. But I do know he's one of the top 32 quarterbacks and maybe more like top 20-ish quarterbacks when he's playing at his best, right? That right there creates – it's a good problem, right? It's a, it's a good problem for the Bears to have. They get that number one overall pick because you it's have to a make tough, a calculated it's a tough, decision. It, it's a tough decision because I've watched Justin. I like Justin. He was my second highest rated quarterback that year behind Trevor. And I think when you look at 
where we are in the evaluation of Justin the Fields, getting him more help. But that may that may go by the boards when he's traded because yeah. Atlanta, you now maybe he's grew up in Georgia, he played at Georgia and they transferred to Ohio yeah. State. Atlanta to me is Ritter shown enough. I don't think so necessarily. We'll see I don't how think he does so either. Yeah. But the, you know, somebody's going to win that division field. I don't know who it's going to be, but somebody's going to win a bad division, right? And it right. like six, yeah. seven, wherever they are. So how does Ritter play down a stretch? Fields now is kind of – he's auditioning, right? So, again, right. does he show them enough? Does he show another team enough? Because they, they want him to play good for them, but they also want him to play really good to get him really to say, hey, go get this guy. We want draft picks in return. They don't have a second. He gave it up for Montez Sweat, right? Yep, that's worked out pretty well, by the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you think about where we are, worked out better than the Chase Claypool thing. Sure, (laughs) yeah. For Chicago, you take Caleb Williams, who we agree is, could be special, could be special, and then you move Justin Fields to Atlanta, New Orleans, whoever, right? For a mid-round pick, probably, right? And you recoup that, sure, there's some of those draft picks, the second-round pick in particular, and then you move on and you do things. You reset the clock and all the things you do with the picks of the quarterback. So that's the decision. But does Justin Fields show enough down the stretch to make them say, let's deal that pick? It's going to be fascinating to see how that plays. That is Arizona. I'm sticking with Kyler Murray from Arizona. I'm helping Kyler Murray. I'm, I've seen enough for Kyler Murray over the years, and we know what we sure. like to come out to say Kyler Murray is your quarterback. New England is Bill Belichick there. What does New England do? You got to yep. believe they're going to take Drake May. You got to believe or Jaden Daniels. Or Jaden Daniels, Mel. There Daniels. we go. Yeah. Now, so now, you're, now you're talking. I feel like yeah. yelling about that. And then <laughs> Washington stick with Sam Howell. Yep. Remember a few years ago, I thought they should have taken Tua or Justin Herbert. They didn't. Remember, they thought I think Chase, I was a Chase Young year. I was yes, training. Was. You got to get the quarterback. Yep. As, you know, to me, what, it, what is what they do now? They have Sam Howell shown flashes, but he's also hasn't defined that he's a, a top fifteen quarterback. Yeah. So, what does Chicago do? The Raiders look like they are going to have to take a quarterback. O'Connell's had his moments, but he's had some struggles, and he wasn't, in my opinion, as highly regarded. So, the Raiders are another team. So, it's going to be really How about the Giants. And the Giants, and then Tennessee getting Will Levis, the speed at wide receiver. They're going to benefit from. Maybe Odunze being gone, but there's Malik yeah. Neighbors, Keon Coleman sitting there. So it may fall well for the Titans, helping out their uh, talented young quarterback, Will Levis. So I think the decisions these teams make on quarterbacks that they have in their building, that they know more about than anybody. We see what we see on Sunday's field. They see, the, yep. the, the, is he galvanized team? Is the locker room believe in him? Is he the first one in, last one out? The, yeah, again. All these things are going to be playing out between now and late April, but they're going to be it's, it's fun to, to evaluate these players. It's going to be fun to see and fascinating to see what decisions these teams make on their existing quarterbacks. Totally, Mel. I couldn't agree. It gets me so fired up because uh, we have just a wonderful time of the year. We've got four more weeks of regular season football. And in four weeks from today, we'll have the 20, let's see, the first 18 selections in the uh, 2024 NFL draft. Field. They say tournament. it's Christmas season. It's how the most wonderful time of the year. Yeah. For everybody, it's the most wonderful for football, no for the doubt. coming down the stretch, the second best. football. We got the, the playoffs coming up. We got the NFL draft. We got Christmas. I got multiple trees up. I know you do, Phil. So uh, we're yeah, ready we're to go. Around. So it is the most wonderful time of the year. Mel, I've learned a lot over this conversation. I have to be honest with the viewers who are listening right now, or I should say watching right now on YouTube. I've also learned I need a blackout shade for my house because I've noticed that all of a sudden from like as, you know, it's, it's a winter time. I live in Connecticut. The sun starts to go down around noon. And, and, you know, the, the light changes and it looks like I have, a, I'm like a cow. I've got a spot on my face that has grown bigger during the show. So I apologize for those that are watching right yeah, now fine. on YouTube. Making yeah, fun gonna, of I, like, you know? I like all the background you got going there, Phil. It's, it's, it's great. I like man. a lot of stuff. I'm trying to get a Mel Kuyper original 1983 <laughs> draft guide up here somewhere. Hopefully <laughs> we'll get John Elway on the cover. The Is that right? John Elway. Of the 83. Yeah. 83. It's a it's quite a draft to start off with. Uh, you must have thought to yourself, geez, like. Man, is it really going to be this good every year at the quarterback yeah, spot? Yeah, I started out. My first book was 79. First draft okay, for I'm, ESPN was 84. Boomer Esiason. My first oh, okay. draft I, for ESPN year was 84 wow, with Boomer. John wow. Elway was 83. Remember yep. Jim McMahon was the cover on the cover of a book. So, wow. yeah, we go. go, go What's it, 46 years now? 45. 46 I don't even years? know. I, I, was, I, I, I was, stopped counting, too. I was off by about a half dozen when I said 40 or 41 <laughs> earlier. So, uh, well, the point is you are the godfather of the draft. It's a we'll lot get of fun. We'll get you the 83 book. We'll get you the 83. I, I'll work on that. Hopefully I'm around for like the 2067 book or something like that as well. I already look forward to reading that. That'll be uh, that'll be Patrick Mahomes, the seventh, who will be in that draft or maybe the third to be in that draft. So the fourth, I guess. Uh, all right, Mel, great stuff. As always, we're coming back, I believe, in two weeks. You and I will be back yeah. for uh, an update. Right after Christmas, stuff. right? Yeah, right after Christmas. We'll come back. We'll talk more shop. But uh, for those that have watched this on YouTube, thank you. Be sure to check it out wherever you get your podcast as well. 
Uh, I was going to say for Mel, but you guys already know who he is for the great Mel Kuyper Jr. on Field Yates. Talk to you guys again here on a couple of weeks on First Draft.